um, Acts 3 verse 1. One day, Peter and John uh, were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. Just to, to say, um, like we're going through the last number of weeks and months uh, just t- talking about our words, watching our words, like the, the, act, the power of our words, um, the potential within what we say, that w- what, it, what it can do. In, in our own lives, with, our, with regards to our self-talk, but even with regards to those that we are, that are part of our family, to those that are part of our community, those that are in our sphere of influence, the, the power of our words, the potential of what our words can do um, is, is cause for us to take this really seriously. And um, James, I think James is possibly right when he says, if you can get this right, which is why I feel like I just want to keep recycling this, this like these these sermons, because I, as I said last week, this feels incredibly fresh for me. And I know, I hope you know me well enough to know that I'm never standing up here uh, with some sort of with some sort of preach of this is what I've worked out and sorted out. Won't you come and join me? That's never the case. Like this feels like I'm right in the midst of this, uh, really wrestling through this stuff, and um. And James is, is suggesting in his letters, and we could probably go to other places in Paul's letters, where if you can get control of your tongue, if you can get control of what's coming out of your mouth, like you're going to be able to take control of everything else, is what James, to paraphrase James a wee bit, that's, that's what he is suggesting. And so this feels really important. And maybe I'm stretching this story here, but I, I, this is probably one of my favorite stories in Acts. Acts chapter 3, and, um, and as I found myself just back in this story over the last couple of days, I just felt like there was some stuff around how we speak and how we see people that, that just became really, really important. I felt like there was some stuff in here for my learning, and I hope I can communicate that would help us, us all this morning. But Acts chapter 3, verse 1 to 10. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. And just to say, later on, we find out a wee bit more about this man, only the fact that he was, uh, he was around 40. So this, is, this has been going on for 40 years. Can you imagine this? Carried from birth to the temple gate called Beautiful and where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his, them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. And if I was to ask for a show of hands, we could tell right now who has been grown up in church their whole lives, uh, because in your head you're now singing, walking and leaping and praising God in the name of Jesus Christ. So tempted to sing it, resisting the urge. Uh, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts and again, all of this stuff, like there's so much stuff in this story because he was at the temple. He was at the temple gates. He could never go beyond because he was deemed as impure. He was deemed as unworthy because of his, because of his disability. Um, he couldn't cross the temple gates. And so now here he is in the temple courts walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who was sitting begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And so just this, like, it's just a, I'm moved by this story all the time because 40 years sitting at this gate, 40 years sitting at the entrance to the temple and all of these people just year after year went past them to go to the place to, to, to worship God. And uh, even that, the image of that is, is deeply challenging. But as I got, began, to, you began to like try to, and I'm not really good at this, trying to immerse yourself in somebody else's story. Um, I'm going to be better at that. But imagine 40 years every day sitting at the temple gate. 
And then after a certain period of time, he's into adulthood and he begins to hear stories of Jesus. And again, I'm rubbish with geography, but what I do know is that the other side of the temple was the Pool of Bethesda. Um, the other side of where this man was sitting was the Pool of Bethesda, where, and I'm sure he would have heard the stories. And obviously we don't know this. Um, I'm using license to, to assume that he would have began to hear stories of this man, Jesus. He'd have heard stories of this man also who had been lame that made his way into the Pool of Bethesda and was miraculously healed. He began to hear the stories of Jesus. And uh, you just wonder what, what was going on in his mind, what was, what was going on in his heart. Was there something, was there some sort of expectation began to stir in this man as he began to hear the stories about Jesus? And what I, what I sort of wrestle with in a way is that this, this, uh, this temple was a place that Jesus would have been familiar with. And so over and over again, Jesus, I am pretty sure, would have walked past this man. We don't know, again, we don't know what, if Jesus engaged with him, if Jesus spoke with him. But we can be pretty confident that Jesus would have walked past him. And yet he still remained lame. He still remained at the temple gate every day begging for money. You just wonder, was Jesus anticipating this moment? Was Jesus holding out with expectation for, for this moment? And again, just because... Uh, just because there's, there's, there's a guy on, um, that, that does these really um, interesting videos that sort of uh, shows you where all of these things took place. And so from the temple gate where this man was sitting, you can see in a, like from here to that house over there, you could, s like, you could see the Mount of Olives. And so you be I begin to imagine, like, geez, he's thinking, like, is... Uh, is, gee, am I going to be healed after 40 years of sitting at this temple gate? Am I going to be healed? Am I going to be one of the stories that I've heard about? Begins to hear the stories of Jesus, and then maybe from the temple gate, he looks out to the Mount of Olives in the day of ascension and sees Jesus being ascended. And you wonder, like, is, does he feel like all hopes are now dashed? All hope is gone because the man that could have healed, the man that could have, uh, that could have restored brought me back my life, brought me back my dig, brought back some sort of dignity is now gone. But not long after the ascension of Jesus, the Spirit is poured out. We have this incredible account in Acts chapter 1 and 2 where the Spirit is poured out, the day of Pentecost. And those that are following Jesus, that have, that have said yes to following Jesus, are filled, empowered by the Spirit. And that, I think that is what changes everything. And the first story that we have is this upon uh, Peter and John, uh, the disciples being filled with the Spirit. And I'm just totally convinced that a filling of the Spirit causes us to see differently. And so Peter and John, again, they would have walked past this man over and over again, every day making their way into the temple. They stood at the gates every day begging for money. But the Spirit has been poured out, and now Peter and John have a new lens. They're seeing things differently. Well, what I've always found moving about this story is is Peter stopping pausing and uh, and telling the man look at us there's just something I don't even know how to articulate it but there's just I find something moving about Peter wanting the man to look at them because he's been so used to he's been so used to people walking past him he's been so used to people ignoring him he's been so used to people treating him as other as inferior so used to feeling invisible, so used to even maybe some maybe that would have came and dropped some money into his hand. He just got so used to any sort of relationship or encounter being transactional. Used to feeling invisible, all of that sort of stuff. And so Peter, I think this, the, the intentionality of this can be lost on us, but Peter stops and he wants him to look. Almost like he's getting them on the same level because when he ha has him look at us, he says, you, in spite of your disability, in spite of you feeling like you're other, I have nothing else to offer you. They, they're on the same level in this moment. They see, he is seeking common ground, I believe. He says, I have nothing else to offer you but Jesus. And, um, and I, um, I'm hoping I'm not stretching this, but what I want us to consider in this story, but just as we walk with Jesus and as we engage with family and people within our lives, 
how we speak to, the words that we use about people or to people is determined by how we see them. And I think we, we see that in, in the story. There was a new level of engagement. There was a different way that Peter and John spoke to this guy because of how they now seen him. They looked at him in the eye. And it truly is um, easier. What, what is really challenging in our multi, increasingly multicultural world and multicultural communities is you do recognize, and it's like this is not... Uh, this is not condemning in any way, but it is just recognizing that it is so much easier whenever we have common ground, when we speak the same language, when we're part of the same culture, it is really easy. And we instinctively form tribes. We instinctively uh, form tribes because it, that, that's just comfort. It's solidarity, and we love all of these things. Those things are important. It avoids conflict, which we all want to do, mostly. Um, and the, tr the, the, the truth is, the reality is, is because of the culture that we've grown up in, because of the language that we share, because of the same stories that we've inhabited, um, we all wear a certain lens. We can't help it. Sometimes when I'm in, in conversation with people, I have to constantly remind myself this, and I'm also trying to remind others that we can't help it, but we all are approaching things with a certain lens and that skews the way that we see things for good or for bad there's an unconscious bias in us all and that's not a negative thing i think but i do think it is really important that we that we own it that we own the fact that we cannot help but come to, to certain things um because of our culture because of our upbringing that our lens that we wear skews the way that we see things Like I was even aware of this this morning, driving, driving over in the car. Not just because it was Sunday, because every so often I will stick UCB on. But it was a wee bit of, it's Sunday morning. I can't be listening to talk sport on a Sunday morning before church. Um, so I was listening to UCB. And, and uh, the minute I heard the, the voice of the man that was speaking, I turned, I turned it over to a different channel. And maybe it was because I was speaking here this morning that I thought, I better not do that. I'm hoping that there's something deeper going on in me than, than that. But I, I heard who was speaking, and I just immediately was like, I, like, I don't agree with his opinions on some things. I, I see things a certain way because of how I've been brought up, of how I've been taught scripture. It's, I, I cannot help, but that skews the way that I see things. It's the way that I think. And so I turned them off because I, and then I realized I have held all this assumption. I have an already formed opinion about this man. I, um, I turned the channel back to listen to him. And I listened to him for 10 minutes. And I felt like, not deeply rebuked, but I felt like mildly rebuked. Because <laughs> I listened to him and I, and I did all that I could to lay aside all of my uh, previously formed opinions that I'd picked up through sound bites, that I'd picked up through what other people on social media had said. It was embarrassing, embarrassing to admit that. Um, we just began to hear him talk about Jesus, and like, just so grateful that um, he was communicating something so beautiful and so powerful. And at the same time, I'm like, oh man, like, what do you? What do you miss out on because of your already formed opinions? And the, and the truth is that you can, I could blame social media. I could have a blast at social media right now, which would be easy to do. Um, the truth is that it, whether it's on social media or just in life in general, it does feel at times that everyone is speaking, but no one is listening. Um, and I realized that myself as I'm listening, as, a, as I'm like in some sort of engagement with this guy that was speaking, I realized that I've, I've just been speaking my own thoughts, my own opinions, and I've never actually sat and listened. And words, I read this quote this week, words in essence are the bridge between the speaker and the listener. And if the speaker cannot construct a sturdy bridge, the meaning conveyed by the words cannot reach its destination, the listener. 
And so I would suggest that next to prayer, next to prayer, listening is the best way to create a positive environment, a positive context for, con uh, for conversation. We talked about it a wee bit, wee bit about that last week, um, about prayer, about even in our conversations, that we come into conversations as maybe, as maybe awkward as it sounds, to come prepared when you're going meeting for somebody for coffee. But there's just an intentionality around that. There's an intentionality around praying about the conversations that you're about to enter into. Whether it's coffee with a friend or whether it's going to visit somebody who's sick, whatever it is, the, the, the prayer is the best way to create a positive environment for conversation. And next to prayer, listening. And the, uh, the truth is, um, we, we cannot control how we are received. But we can definitely help our cause. And so, I, again, I'm challenged by this personally, but I'm like, I'm really, in conversations with a few other people involved in the church world, just like really feeling like there's a lot of work needs done here. That, of course, we cannot control how we are received, but we can definitely help our cause. And sometimes what we say, it's not even the what we say, it's, it's how we say it and when we say it at times um, causes us to be received in a negative way. And we cannot, I know that we cannot help that, but I am convinced that we can definitely help our cause. And, and there's a wee bit of what is happening here that I'm taking some lessons from. Because I'm, and maybe I'm, again, maybe I'm stretching it, but I'm just totally convinced that Peter was seeking common ground. That he was taking a moment engaging him in, with eye contact because he was seeking common ground. Look at us. Look at me. Got to the same level and then recognized that I have nothing to give you apart from Jesus. Nothing of any, there's no resources that I can offer you here apart from Jesus. There's no, um, there's no sermon I can give you here I've only got Jesus. There's even, there's, I just I appreciate that about what's going on here. There's no, there's no sermon. There's no. This is what you have to believe. There's, there's, there's none of that. There's just like the, all we have is Jesus, and in His name, come on, take my hand. Take my hand, and and, and I'll lift you. I'll carry you. I'll walk with you. And I, and I think there is learning enough for us, because proper listening. Proper listening forces us to walk in somebody else's shoes. Proper listening for, forces us to, like, to, to wear someone's hat, or whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, again, briefly mentioned it last week. And again, it's something I'm actively, like there's moment, not always, but actively trying to make sure that I'm, and I have to train myself, like I have to be really intentional about it because it's not my default. My default is to listen to respond and, but it's probably been really helpful, actually, to be at the castle this week. So I've been, I've been up at the castle with mum and dad being away. And I've been sharing my week, uh, sharing my evenings and my mornings. I get to come home with, during the afternoon um, with three young men from, from Somalia. And I suppose this has really helped me. I'm listening to understand. Because here's three guys, completely different culture for me. Completely different religion, completely different understanding. See, trying to communicate to three young Somalian boys about what Halloween is about, and like, impossible. Like, and you realize, you, could, you just get so embedded in something, you get so like, used to your, your culture that you don't even sometimes think about it. Um, so it was, it was a tricky one to try and uh, explain, like trick-or-treating and all of that sort of stuff, uh, with language barriers and all of that. But anyway, just listening, uh, listening in order to understand compared to listening to respond is, is a huge difference. And that, that can be easy, quite easy, whenever you're talking maybe about Halloween or you're talking about maybe things that are relatively minor. But the more divisive issues, I'm not going to, uh, reluctant to touch on it, but if, you were, if anybody's on social media coming up to, even though like we're 
distant from it in many ways. Uh, the divisiveness of American politics is like, and, and how it has infiltrated the church, honestly, has made me angry and heartbroken in all sorts of different ways over the last number of weeks. But I'm convinced that even on divisive issues that we do not have to move position. You don't have to change your, like your, your, your beliefs or your strongly held views, but you, you can still listen to understand. And I'm just totally convinced that the church in general hasn't done that. And I, think that's, and I think that's why we are often maybe received negatively. Because we haven't listened to understand, we've just listened to respond, and there's, there's no way uh, to engage, to love, to serve, whenever that is our posture. And why I love that this, this is the first moment we have after the Holy Spirit being poured out is because it's the Holy Spirit that leads us to see things that we have missed before. And I just know that there is people within our lives, within our communities, that are, like, again, to stretch a metaphor, like, that are at our, we have, where is your beautiful gate? We have, I think we have those people, those places in, in all of our lives that it would just take the Holy Spirit to lead us to see things that we may have missed before. And the reality is, in, in, our, in our multicultural world, multi-opinionated world, that it's going to take getting to know each other before we can communicate effectively. I'm really trying, I really am trying my best to refrain from making assumptions. I'm really trying to do that. So I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm never going to be able to communicate effectively never going to be able to use my words well if I don't understand. And so whether that's for somebody from a different culture or whether it's somebody that's sitting beside me in this room today, I'm never going to be able to communicate effectively if I don't make steps toward. And again, I'm hoping I'm not stretching this for the sake of it, but I do think that again, that's what Peter was doing. As he... As he, as he as he says to the to the to the lame man, I wish we wouldn't use his name. Maybe we should just put a name in, so I'm not calling him that. Um, he said to Dave, "Look at us. Look at us." And he takes him by the hand, like he it's almost like he's like he's want, committed himself to walking in his shoes. He's taken steps toward. And I think if we want to be able to communicate effectively, that's what we need to be able to do. And I love, again, I love what Paul, those, those words in 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul, Paul did that, essentially. I think that when Paul is saying, I became, I became a Jew to win the Jews, I became a Gentile, I became like one under the law, I became like one not under the law, in order, in order to, to, to help people meet Jesus, essentially. And so in order for Paul to be heard, in order for people to hear the good news about Jesus, to build relationship, he, 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 was commi he committed himself to walking in their shoes. Because that's essentially what he was doing. Um, he enveloped himself in their culture. He committed himself to, to understanding. Something happened within Paul that caused him to see them to see others differently. Those who have been brought up with different opinions, those who have been brought up with different backgrounds, different cultures, something happened within Paul and the Holy Spirit came upon him that caused him to see people differently. And so for him to be heard, he walked in their shoes, he enveloped themselves in their lives and his message was heard and it was responded to. Again, another quote. Sorry, I don't have who it was written by we need to understand that relationship is not automatic it must be built and not assumed even in the body of Christ you have to live into it while the framework and the potential are present relationship doesn't happen until you build it and it really is far easier to love people when you understand them it's far easier to love people when you know them when you work with them and not against them. 
And again, this is stuff that we are, we are learning. Like it feels like we're actively learning this. Um, with, when we think of some of the kids that, that, that we have cared for. Like I, I think of some of my reactions to some of the kids that we have looked after before we've got to know them. Before we've got to understand their stories. And not that it doesn't still like break your heart when they, when they make unhelpful or unwise decisions. But there's still something that because you've learned to understand them. Because you've like learned to walk with them. And even though you still deeply disagree with much of what they say and do, um, it is still easier to love them. And still easier to, like, to take her hand and walk through some of the mess and all of that. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that genuine love, genuine love can't exist without understanding. Genuine love cannot exist without understanding. And so Galatians chapter 6, I'm going to finish with this, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, another one of Paul's helpful, yet probably challenging instruction is bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And, uh, and we were praying in the prayer hut this morning and it was just, just as that verse came to mind as I was thinking about this morning. To bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That seems pretty important. But the reality is, and what I prayed this morning, and I think it's fair to say that to carry someone's burdens, you need to know what burdens them. And uh, I'm increasingly convinced that with that awareness, as you've made steps towards, as you've sought common ground, as you've, like, as you've looked people in the eye, committed to understanding them, it, with that awareness, with knowing what their burdens are, knowing what it is that burdens in them, it will affect how you see them. It will affect how you see them, and I, again, am hoping and believing that the knock-on effect without it just becomes the most natural knock-on effect is that then you will carefully choose what to say and when to say it and how to say it. And I think that's an important lesson for me. I really believe that it's an important lesson for the church. And to close out this story, like something miraculous happens. We, can't, we don't want to get away from that. Something miraculous happens when Peter and John crossed that divide in many ways. This huge, like social divide. I mean, not necessarily cultural, but like there, we all have different divides that we need to cross. This social divide was the one that these guys crossed, and they, the miracle happened. They convinced of, and they crossed that divide, and they seen this man differently. They understood this man differently. They loved him differently, and they offered him the only thing that they had, which was Jesus. And that, that moment at the beautiful gate, this moment brought opened up the door for more and more people to come to Jesus. We see that when he made his way into the temple gates, um, people recognized who he was, recognized what had taken place, and there people were in wonder and, and amazement. And um, and I, and I just I'm like some sort of blessed naivety to think that that could happen for all of us. Again, maybe I'm stretching metaphors all over the place today. Where is, where is your beautiful gate? What would happen? What would happen? What could possibly happen? What miraculous potential is there if you were to stop, to listen, to look in the eye, to understand what could it open up? So Father, um, help us. The Holy Spirit, we are so grateful that we, uh, that we don't walk this by ourselves. Forgive us when we try to. Forgive me for when I try to. Um, the Holy Spirit, we're just, we're, we're just um, asking that uh, we would have the fresh dependency, God. We thank you for those moments where we're reminded, where Jesus reminds the disciples, reminds us that um, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. 
We just pray that as we consider how we are received by one another in the room, how we're received um, by those that we rub shoulders with. God, would you help us to to come to the posture of understanding? Help us to come to the place of seeking common ground, of loving people really well in order that we can offer them the only thing that they need the only thing that's going to make any difference is Jesus we love you thank you for who you are thank you for what you've done thank you for what you've invited us into Jesus it feels like you could have you could have healed that man in a moment during your lifetime but there's just something so deeply inherent in the nature of God that wanted to partner with us to see your kingdom come to see lives restored from across every social, cultural divide. And so, God, thank you for what you've entrusted to us. We want to take it seriously. We want to take the words that we, that we use seriously. Help us to be mindful of how we say them, when we say them. We thank you. Bless each person in this room. Bless each family. For those that are, con- that are on holiday, for those that are serving somewhere else today, pray for David in the States. Pray to physically restore him even right now, Jesus. Uh, For Nigel, for Mum and Dad and Paul, for others, God, for Bridget and Jimmy. God, bless, restore, renew um, this family. Thank you for it, God. So grateful for this group of people. And I pray to encourage them and bless them this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.